some notes for you all before we get going. Obviously, it is live, but yeah. it's a podcast. Hey, nerds. Farmer Jesse here with a special episode of the podcast for you this week. In March, the No-Till Growers team and I went down to the Organic Growers School Conference outside of Asheville, North Carolina, where we held a public roundtable discussion with Aaron Worrell of Cedar Chest Farm, as well as Lyric and Noah of Wild East Farm. The topic of the conversation was effectively scaling up from homestead to farm business. We get to hear the stories of how both of these farms started on a very small scale and smartly scaled up their operations, plus tips, lessons, and helpful thoughts on business startup. If you like these sorts of roundtables, let us know and we'll try to set up more in the future. Uh, one quick shout out to Organic Grower School. Organic Grower School is the premier provider of practical and affordable organic education in Southern Appalachians. Their mission is to inspire, educate, and... It's windy here. Their mission is to inspire, educate, and support people to farm, garden, and live organically. After 30 years, they continue to build a vibrant food and farming community by boosting the success of organic home growers and farmers. They envision a mutually supportive network of prosperous farmers, productive gardeners, and informed consumers engaged in creating healthy communities. Check them out at organicgrowerschool.org. Otherwise, that's it for me. Here's that conversation with Aaron, Lyric, and Noah. All right, everyone, welcome to the uh, No-Till Growers Live Roundtable here uh, in Mars Hill, North Carolina. My name is Jesse. I have the absolute uh, pleasure, privilege of hosting this particular talk today. I'm going to introduce our guests momentarily. Um, but I wanted to quickly shout out the Organic Growers School for this excellent conference that they're putting on uh, for Mars Hill University for hosting it. And... Um, and yeah, and go mountain lions. That's their mascot I learned today. So yeah, that's fun. And uh, today's talk is going to be about scaling up the backyard garden or homestead to a production scale. So taking a passion for gardening, for instance, or taking a, you know, your homestead and moving that up to something that may make you a little or a lot or be of money or be your entire business. Um, and first, just quick introduction. I have Aaron Wall of Cedar Chest Farm here in, actually in Virginia, not here in North Carolina. Um, and welcome, Aaron. Thank you. And then we have uh, Lyric and Noah over here from East uh, Wild East Farm that is in North Carolina. It's not far from here. And uh, yeah, welcome, y'all. Thank hey. you. Sure. And we'll get a little bit more of an introduction in a second. Uh, but the goal, like I said, the goal today is to discuss that idea of moving up from a homestead to a a farm operation. So um, maybe we could start with you, Aaron. Maybe give us a little bit of, uh, maybe just for context, give us a brief history of your background, of sort of what got you started on this path to begin with. Sure. Um, I am definitely an accidental grower. And um, like many folks, I think that find themselves in the homesteading lifestyle was brought there really by a desire to raise chickens. And we were living in town and constrained uh, by town regulations, couldn't have chickens. So we moved out to a little piece of property. We have four and a half acres. I really just thought I was going to have a garden and about six chickens. And then my garden got bigger and bigger. Um, and we, our family sort of entered that homestead lifestyle, trying to grow subsistence, you know, food for just us. Um, it's kind of where it all started, but it was accidental. It was very one step at a time. And we lived that way for about five years before I decided I wanted to take it into production. Nice. Uh, Lyric, maybe same question for you. Start there. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about where you all were and what was sort of leading up to starting Bigger Farm. Yeah. So Noah and I were homesteading uh, just east of Asheville at a beautiful place called Shope Creek. We were on about three acres that adjoin National Forest, and uh, it was our first time really having direct relationship with our food. We grew a big home garden, we raised rabbits and chickens for eggs and chickens for meat, and it was only about a year into that lifestyle and being connected to our food in that way that we knew we wanted to farm as a vocation and as a way of life. Um, and we took that dream and we walked towards it very slowly. So we homesteaded in that, on that land for six years before moving on to where we now farm. And those six years were just this beautiful learning laboratory of experimenting and continually rooting into the values that we held around farming of 
wanting to be as close to our food as possible, wanting to be as close to the land as possible, and wanting to live a meaningful lifestyle and contribute meaningfully to our community. So we did like a little bit of, um, you know, a little roadside farm stand, a little CSA, kind of experimenting with the the money part, um, but not in a serious way until we moved to our current farm. Noah, maybe we can get a little bit of a context of like, now what does that look like? What you went from that, that sort of three acre and dabbling with some sales to what does it look like now? Yeah, <clears throat> well, just to tag on a little bit to what Lyric was saying, our first year there, it wasn't a big garden. The first year it was a few kale plants and three chickens and some tomato seeds scattered across the ground and just like sending things out without really any know-how and just going for it and chipping away just each year refining and learning and enjoying the process um, and, and honing our, our skills and passion. And then <clears throat> once we moved to Wild East, we were really clear on what we wanted to do to farm. So like the homestead lifestyle that is is a mixed form of agriculture where often people have livestock and vegetables and different forms of production we wanted to take that principle and scale it to the farm as well so from the get-go we started with vegetables on a small scale doing no-till practices and pastured poultry as the two elements of the farm that are, are the financial backbone to get started and we're also integrating uh, pork that we run through the, the woods and, and sheep that we graze on the pastures and kind of still homesteading while we're farming and, and using those side enterprises to uh, still pique our engagement and interest with doing mixed things and provide a small side income and really have a relationship where the animals are, are part of the landscape for, for the ecological development as, as well as uh, just the farm business aspect. So um, we, we kind of made our little homestead really big in that way. Can I piggyback on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, just since I just gave a presentation on agroforestry, another component of the farm is we've planted about 12 acres of tree crops as like a long-term vision uh, of both the economic elements and the um, human relational elements of creating a space where people can come and pick their own food on the farm. And then just because I like to be really transparent about money and really um, like demystify that part of this process, especially going from home scale to farm scale. Um, we went from, you know, our little roadside farm stand at Shope Creek, which made, you know, I think a thousand dollars in a full season, you know, it's like $40 a day when we would set it up um, to our first year as a production farm grossing a hundred thousand dollars. So that's like the scale jump economically. And then from three acres to 44 acres under management is, is the land-based jump. How long was that jump from like a thousand dollars in the season to like a hundred thousand dollars on your land? Was that like several years or was that like in one year when you really made that decision to start? Our, the first year of operating Wild East, we did a hundred thousand dollars in gross sales. And how does that break down? Was that mostly, was that a mixture of animals and vegetables or was it one higher percentage than another? Yeah, it was about 50% uh, chicken. So we sell whole and cut chicken uh, and then about 30% vegetables and about 10% each, uh, about fifth, somewhere about 15% pigs and like 5% events, I would say is like the total breakdown. But chickens are like the main economic driver, chickens and secondarily vegetables. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so Aaron, maybe you can kind of catch us up where you are now, mm -hmm. having started from that sort of like creeping into it sort of accidentally just continuing to add more things like where where are you at now what does it look like yeah we're still on the same piece of property so we have four and a half acres uh the first two acres of that was just a grass front lawn and i put out a massive silage tarp and cleared a quarter acre for mixed vegetable production um since then that was the first season was almost exactly a quarter acre i've since added two large high tunnels and a couple small fields for strawberries and sweet corn so i cultivate about a half acre and i would say a generous one-third acre of that is the diversified veggies i'm servicing a 35 member csa and then i go to the farmer's market weekly and then kind of i guess contrary to what y'all are doing i found that 
as I grew, blew up the veggie enterprise and I really made it my occupation, the homesteading portion had to take a bit of a backseat. Mm. Uh, my partner works off farm. He's um, really supportive, but not, you know, he's not cultivating the land with me. And so I actually just sold my milk cow last week and we no longer do pastured pork. Uh, we'll do uh, pastured poultry for our family, but, uh, and we now only have just a few laying hens for our family. And so for me, the transition to making it a job really meant I needed to be able to be a little bit more singularly focused. So yeah, mm -hmm. same property, but um when I opened up that ground in 2021, my first year was about $17,000 worth of sales just looking at CSA. Um, but the land was a lot more productive than I had hoped and anticipated. And so I started going to farmer's markets, was able to easily more than double that in my second year of production. And now going into year three, my projected crop plans, because I've learned how to manage that land is likely to be double what year two was. That point about like sort of losing the homestead a little bit, yeah. like that element. Uh, that I'm, and I should also give a little bit of my own background because my wife and I, we lived completely off grid for several years. We did, I mean, no running water, no electricity. We were very, very hardcore sort of homesteader. That was our lifestyle for a long time. For like four years, that was it. And then we had a kid and we were like, oh, this isn't possible. Um, <laughs> but uh, so we did that, but we also loved a lot of the aspects of that lifestyle that we kind of had to give up when we moved closer to our family to have a little bit of help with the kids. Um, so we gave up some of that homesteading stuff, but we found that as we did this for a long time, we could start bringing some of those elements back in. Like there was like a sacrificial period mm -hmm. of some of those things that we really loved doing. But now once you get, once we got established, we kind of started to get to bring, I don't know, more of those aspects back in a little bit. Um, and then also, like with selling milk cow, there's some that just don't make sense for us. And we'd rather maybe have that be a part of our community or, or get milk from somebody who we, you know, like to support. And then we can spread that out a little bit. But um, I guess my question would be, like, does that resonate with any of you that you've lost a little bit of that home or maybe for, for Wild East, like you've lost a little bit of that homestead element? And is that, does that resonate at all like it does with Aaron and myself? I can speak to that. I think a little bit, uh, primarily transitioning from uh, just for fun garden to a production garden and the decision making framework there where homesteading garden is just like, oh yeah, we can just like tuck a little plant right there and see what happens. And okay, this bed can be totally experimental and, and fully grown food for ourselves. It's a very different mindset and decisions than uh a market farm. So I think that that is something that we're trying to create beds and spaces and landscaping around the property that aren't in the production area so that we can still have that kind of magic element of interacting with plants in such a curious way um, that we, we developed homesteading. Um, but I think, yeah, in year one, that was, that was an adjustment where we had to put really all of our focus in the market gardens and uh, slowly starting to plant some perennials and um, do some other kind of very small scale fun experimenting with no financial consideration or consequences, which I think is important on a farm, even if it's just a little thing, just having a fun project that there's no pressure to it. It's it, whatever the outcome is, it's just because you feel like doing it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with what Noah said. I feel fiercely protective of my relationship with homesteading or just intuitive relationship with the earth. So I have like worked very intentionally to preserve that. And I feel like all my free time, I'm just still harvesting violets and making medicine and, you know, saving seeds from really special plants and keeping them in my special area. Um, so yeah, I feel, I feel like it's possible to integrate, but it certainly takes a a level of intention and dedication um, because it, it's for me, it's, it's a different space that occupies that I occupy in my brain and body with like that intuitive relationship with the land. Um, and it comes into production farming for sure and informs our production practices significantly. Um, but I, I do feel them as distinctly different. So sometimes Noah and I joke that when we're done farming for the day, we just homestead. Uh, like we take a day off and I'm just like canning and doing all those things. Um, they just bring me joy. So I don't know what else I would be doing. I'm curious, you know, maybe to talk about that decision to sort of scale up and the experience of it and maybe what, and we can start maybe with you, Noah, about like 
the experience of scaling up, what were some of the challenges with that? What did that, I don't know, how did you approach, how did that feel when you were going through that experience? And like, was it scary? Was it like, did you feel like you got it all down on paper and felt good about it? Or did you look at paper and say, I hope this works? Like, what was that feeling like? Mm. So I came into that process from maybe a somewhat unique standpoint in that on the one hand, we're homesteading at Show Creek doing the things we're describing. Uh, but during a significant portion of my time doing that, I was also managing a commercial organic uh, vegetable farm as my job. Um, so I was, I was an employee at this farm running operations, and it was a much bigger scale in a lot of ways than our farm is currently now. So for me, within my mind and process, it was simultaneously scaling up and scaling down. And so on the business side of things, there was almost a little bit of relief and ease in that first year because of the scaling down of the production side of where I'd been. Where it's like, wow, this is a much smaller footprint of production and way less intensive management strategies. It's almost like less work than I was doing on that farm. But then figuring out how to take the homesteading uh, methods that we were using for production, doing poultry and vegetables and scaling that up uh, because the veggies I was producing was all tractor based and we, we do, we don't do that anymore. So yeah, I think the process of, uh, you know, applying no-till principles and figuring out how that fits in our specific context has been one of the, I don't even really want to say challenges, but learning opportunities as we've scaled that from a small, about 1,500 square foot backyard garden plot to uh, what we're looking at, about half an acre of, of production in that form now. So yeah, it was an interesting process of scaling up and scaling down at the same time. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Aaron, that same sort of question, but I'm also curious because I know you come from somewhat of a business background. Like, what was that process for you? And then how did it feel making that jump from like doing it in the backyard? And then now I'm going to like actually try and rely on this a little bit. Yeah, I think the greatest fear for me and the biggest risk felt like the financial investment coming in as a grower with no commercial experience. I was not qualifying for things like an FSA loan or, you know, some of these more accessible means of financing. And so it was really what can we do? What can we afford to do? And when you're looking at, it was nine grand to put irrigation in that first year to, you know, dig the hydrants out to the garden and we needed to put in a deer fence. And you're talking about infrastructure in the tens of thousands of dollars. And knowing that my best case business plan this year maybe makes us 15, you know, like I know it, it there won't be any money for the first few years. That, those were the biggest risks it felt like. Um, but it wasn't necessarily, I mean, maybe it's just naivety, um, but there, I had a lot of community support and I think that that went a long way. I chose to do a CSA model because I knew that I could get that investment up front and I sought to be very transparent with my CSA members. Like I'm new, you know, you're seeing me do this for the first time and, and the right people do want to, they're, they're invested in your success. And so, um, I was able to kind of get the capital from the market garden at the front of the season. And while there's always the pressure of like, can I grow it? I tried to make really smart decisions about how many shares do I think I can be confident that I can give them a good product every week for this season and, and then build my way up. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Capital is an interesting element of it too, because the, 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 you know, when you're going from a homestead to, you know, production farm, there's kind of two ways to go about it. You can just start trying to sell more and sell more and sell more and grow a little bit more, or you can use that time on a smaller space to save up the capital that you need to actually start the big production farm. Mm -hmm. So like, what was that for you all? Maybe start with you, Lyric. What was that sort of capital development element for like, how did that go for you? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so since we had several years of knowing that we wanted to start a farm and knowing that the land that we were living on in our homestead would not sustain a true farm business in a way that would support Noah and I being full-time on the land, uh, we knew that we would be looking for land. And so capital was immediately on the mind uh, for a down payment and, and uh, all of the things that Aaron was speaking to as first year startup investments. And so when we decided we wanted to start a farm, we immediately decided to save money. 
And so we were very deliberate. I was just joking in my talk. Um, we have spreadsheets going back to 2016, 2017, yeah. um, where every single month we would sit down together and track how much money we spent on gas, how much money we spent on food, what could we shave and where could we move things um, so that we could be saving as much as possible. And neither of us were working high paying jobs. Noah just shared he was managing a farm. I've been working mostly part time in nonprofit work, neither of which are incredibly lucrative and we do not come from generational wealth so all of what we saved was through very diligent planning and so we were able to save about seventy thousand dollars through that um, almost five-year period of saving money uh, and then we when we moved to the farm we did not purchase our farm so we lease and so we didn't have to pay for a down payment which basically freed up all that capital to be startup investments um, and so we saved twenty thousand of that for our like emergency nest egg personal if the farm fails we're financially okay and can transition to something else and then we put fifty thousand dollars of our own money to start the business and we did not take out loans we got uh, two small grants totaling about um, $11,000 for the year. And that was our startup capital, but we don't own the land. And so there was, um, so, yeah, we did not purchase the farm. The farm is very well infrastructured, uh, already. So we didn't have to spend a lot of money moving water or building buildings. Uh, it was really a turnkey space that we walked into in terms of some of those really big upfront costs. Yeah. The, you know, I think that it's interesting your situation, especially with the lease element, because one of the things that we do as people, who, especially who've been homesteading for a long time, we really care about the land that we're growing on. So the idea of a lease, lease seems somewhat scary and opposite to what our goals are, right? Uh, but the lease does a few different things. One, uh, in, you can and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your specific lease, because I think it's really interesting. Um, but when you buy property, and this is what my wife and I did, it gobbles up your capital. Mm -hmm. Like it is just, an, it is more money than you think it's going to be. All the fixes are on you to pay for those, any sort of improvements. And it is an investment, but if you don't have that money to invest really, then it's just going to suck all of your capital. So it makes starting a farm really hard when you purchase it to begin with, if you don't have like just a bunch of money to start with. Because, you know, in our case, we didn't, my wife and I, were very bootstrappy. Like we were like, we have eight hundred dollars. Let's go, <laughs> and that was not enough. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, but we did, you know, just be like every year was really tough, and then we would just like get a little bit more money, and we'd save some, and we'd figure it out, and we just keep doing that. Um, but capital was like a huge part of that because our obsession was like we need to own the things, we need to buy the things, um, and I don't think that's a bad way of going about it, but it does gobble up your capital quite a bit. Because uh, mortgages are intense and they have to be paid at the end of the month, even if, you know, stuff decided not to grow that month, uh, which happens. Um, so anyway, I think that's like a, I think that's, I'd like to talk a little bit about your all's lease because I think that is like a, uh, an element, especially with the kind of silvio, silvo pastures and a lot of the stuff you're doing, you don't think about that on lease lands. So can you kind of maybe know if you want to, or Lyric, if you feel more comfortable, who wants to talk about like just gen generically what that lease is? Yeah, if you want to talk about the lease, yeah. I could talk on some of the elements you touched on about it being intimidating or, or not necessarily the goal or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the actual structure of the lease, uh, it's a six-year lease to start. The mutual intention is that it would become a 99-year life lease after that initial trial period. <laughs> Neither us nor the landowner was comfortable like signing something like that from the get-go. Um, wanted to feel out the relationship and the land and the business and get that established. Um, but that, that's the current structure and we have a very high level of autonomy in how we farm and, and how we utilize the land. So really it doesn't affect our day-to-day -day decisions or operations in any way. Um, like we, we're not like calling the landowner to see if we can do something. Um, we're just running our business and we own the business outright and all of the assets and so, uh, anything we've purchased for the business is ours. There's no like shared uh, ownership of that whatsoever. And I know Noah wants to talk about this, but I'll just speak a little bit to like the trust aspect. And we had very much 
felt we needed to purchase land to have the long-term tenure that we wanted. And of course, a six-year lease is not a guarantee for a life lease, though it's the hope and the intention. But I feel very grounded in the just more intuitive experience of knowing that this is exactly where we're supposed to be. And the universe has very clearly laid out an opportunity for us to grow as people and as farmers and to feed our community. And there's just no reason we wouldn't take the risk and, and try. Um, yeah, I was, I was pretty much going to say that. Oh, I don't sorry. have, it's fine. Sorry. I don't have much more to say besides, yeah, I think uh, zooming out a little more holistically and whatever direction it could go with the fact that we don't own the land, there's so much to be gained in the, the personal development and the relationships with our neighbors that we're building and, and the skills and just uh, it goes so far beyond just is the farm going to be on this piece of land forever? Like, even if it isn't everything just in the first 15 months we've been there, even if we had to leave tomorrow, it would have been worth it. Um, so I think that that has led us to feel a lot of ease in that process uh, and not fixate on the unknown um, and just trust the day to day. Is there anything you want to add to that in terms of like capital stuff or just that, I don't know, that feeling of like you all own your land. So mm. there is maybe a slightly different approach to that in terms of like, I don't know, the things that you would, I guess another way of putting this is like, if you own land, you do feel more, I don't know, uh, likely to do bigger projects, bigger capital projects, because you know, there will be some return on that long term. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, and I don't know that it's holding you back, but it could. And for some people on a lease land, certainly hold them back from doing, I don't know, digging the pond or building certain infrastructure because they're like, well, I can't take it with me or you make it modular or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, is there anything that you, does it, is it freeing to be in an ownership position for you? In some ways, but I think what's interesting about my approach and how I came upon my farm on the land that I already had was that we didn't buy our home or our property with farming in mind whatsoever. And so I didn't know it was a dream I had at the time. And now I have this thriving business. I have this farm, this lifestyle I built that I love. And I am very much constrained by the land that we own that we had to build it on. Mm. Where had I known when we were shopping for a new home that this was the long-term goal, it probably is not the land we would have purchased. Mm. So that, um, you know, it comes with its own set mm. of challenges. Uh, at this point, I could not cultivate any more land. There is land, but it's heavily, you know, very steep pasture only. So it's forcing me, which I appreciate because I am a, mostly a one woman operation to be more thrifty with the land that I do have. But yeah, I think that now I'm, I'm held in place by the land we do own, which was a really a decision and a conversation completely separate from ever intending to start a farm. Mm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's another thing when it comes to, it's like, you don't know what you don't need or you don't know what you mm -hmm. want necessarily until you've done it for a while. Mm -hmm. So like in your all situation, knowing Lyric that you were, you know, you spent so much time thinking about your farm before you got it, but you also didn't totally get to choose the land. Like you chose the land that you're on, but like there, there's limited access to land here. So you kind of had to fit your vision to that. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is not necessarily about that, but my question is like, are there things about uh, that you would recommend to somebody who's looking at scaling up or getting land to think about in terms of the land itself to look for or to, you know, you know, avoid or et cetera. Yeah, I think, so we put together over that time of preparing a pretty comprehensive uh, site selection criteria list that broke down categories from, landform, you know, aspect and, and slope and kind of those considerations to proximity to towns and recreation. And uh, it's very holistic all the way from how we can produce to how we want our day-to-day -day life to be. And by having that, we were able to it, it, turn down opportunities that came our way because it was clear you know, we could maybe get kind of excited about a place, but when we look through the criteria, it's like, well, this only checks like four out of 50 boxes. We just have to say no, you know, even if this opportunity is here. So over that period of preparation, there were opportunities to pursue land in a lease or, or even buying places that we just decided not to because we knew 
for the type of farm we wanted to start and the resources we wanted available there and for the quality of life we wanted, that wouldn't have been the place for that. Um, and then when we visited where we are now for the first time, we pulled out the sheet and it checked literally every single box, which we didn't think would ever happen. And uh, it was in that moment of like putting the piece of paper down, looking at each other. It was like, this is it, you know, uh, there's kind of no doubt in our minds. So, and if it hadn't, we would have kept doing what we were doing at Show Creek and been happy with that until the right thing emerged. I think that that's an important part of our context is we were so content with the lifestyle we had homesteading that there was no big rush to get to this point. And it was like, we were open to when the right moment came and that freed us up to, to find the right opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, I, yeah, I think the, um, I think I, there's a lot in there. I feel like, well, one, Aaron, is there anything when you're thinking about like, what would you want different or what should somebody look for that you didn't think you weren't thinking about it because you just dealt with the land you had, but like, is there anything you would say to somebody that's in that situation or what is that? What did you feel like your land is missing? Um, I think much to what Noah said, you know, there's the topography element, there's access to markets. You, if you're going to shop for land with a farm goal in mind, you do have sort of these basic needs. For me personally, where I feel restrained um, is that I would love to, I, I didn't know how much I would care about the health of my soil. As a home gardener, I really was kind of throwing things in wherever. And maybe I was growing a hundred tomato plants, but they were 70 different varieties because it was fun to see what <laughs> they were all like. We're now, you know, things are much more streamlined. And so I'm, I feel very, um, tied to my, like, I would love to do more cover cropping, for example, which would require some beds to be out of production longer that I don't really feel like I can do because of how much space that I have. Um, my pathways are only 12 inches because that's all, you know, and that felt big enough at the time. And now I'm pushing harvest, you know, buckets down the middle and tripping over my own feet. And so there's things like that, that I don't think you know until you're intuitively there and land is like a living thing and you're a living thing and your farm is a living thing. And so you go in with intention and it changes, but th those are the things I think I wish that I had on my space that I, I can't really change at this point. Yeah. Hmm. And another thing it sort of brings to mind is the, you know, when we, my wife and I have had several different farms. Uh, I think we are on our fifth farm. It's probably our last. I mean, don't quote me on that, <laughs> but I think it's our last. Um, but in that experience, like we've realized, and this is sort of what you all were talking about. Every time we leave a place, we feel pretty good about it. Like we're like, we just improved the fire out of that place. Like it looks like I'll go back to some of those old farms and I'll be like, this looks great. I mean, you know, depending on what the landowner did, but I can tell the soil is done, is better, is better off from us being there. And I was like, isn't that kind of, to some extent, the point? Like, we get really precious about the things that we have, and especially when it comes to perennials. We want to be there to sit on our own vine and fruit tree. Like, we want to be there to pick the fruit that we planted. But, like, we also just want the fruit to be planted and the, you know, we want it to exist in the world. That's why we do it also. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think that just thinking back to, like, what you all were talking about, um, yeah, I think that's really an important way of looking at it. And also, uh, I don't know, sort of deleting that, that fear or that ambition of permanence of just for ourselves. And then instead of just like, it's for everything, it's for everybody, it's mm -hmm. for the future, it's for that soil, it's for that, you know, microclimate, it's for that community. Um, and doing that work on a, on a bigger scale, I guess. I don't know. Does anybody, does that resonate with anybody? It does for me. I mean, you were talking earlier about the homesteading element sort of having to take a step back and there really hasn't been much of a sadness in that for me because uh, I mean, everyone comes to homesteading with their own ideologies and reasons for it. But I think a hallmark of it tends to be a self-sufficiency mindset. And I discovered this richness in community sufficiency when I had an abundance of produce, like maybe I didn't have all of the other stuff that I had before for my own table, but that it brought me these connections with other people that 
you know, you can barter and trade and there's knowledge exchange and you meet new people in your community. And yeah, it's really not about the particular vegetables in the dirt on my property. It becomes a much bigger conversation. And, um, you know, there would be elements about leaving any farm that you pour that amount of labor and time and love into that's difficult to leave. But I think for me, there is this release of I've done really good things here. Mm -hmm. And if that fire is still alive in me to continue to do those good things, I could apply that to the next place. And it would be a new, beautiful thing that would impact new people. And then you just wait, you know, 10 more years for your fruit. And <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I mean, just to sort of add to what you were saying about, uh, community sufficiency. I always say that it's like, there's no, there's really no such thing as self-sufficiency. It's community sufficiency. Or it's insufficiency because the reality is you can't do it all on your own. And, and you can't, and you shouldn't try because there are, when we do that, I think we miss the point, but we also fail the land. Like we can't do it all and we can't do it all well by ourselves. Um, so involving other people. And, and that's something I can always be better about myself too, because I, 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 I don't know, I go through the same cycles of the earth, right? The earth like pushes out in the spring and then draws back in in the, in the winter. And I feel that way too. Like I draw back in sort of introverted for time periods. And then I go through periods where I'm very social. And I think it's both being in tune with that. And then also, you know, trying to push yourself to be, to involve more community. Um, I don't know, Lyric, do you have anything that, does that? I would that say that's, on that? sure. I would say that would be my, fundamental I don't want to give anyone advice but what's been fundamental in our process uh, and has informed our our value system and our successes within our business is relationships mm -hmm. and I could not even conceive of doing what we've done in our first year of our farm without having 10 years of established relationships in this place um, we've been so wholly supported by community from like the customer level to the volunteers to just having connections when we like need a wood chipper, whatever it is, um, just feeling received and feeling known for the gifts that you're trying to give to the world uh, allows them to be given, I think, and allows them to be received. So I would say human relationships are uh, inseparable from the ecological relationships on the farm and, and the economic viability of a farm. Yeah. Um, yeah, completely agree. Uh, Noah, is there, when we're thinking about this idea of scaling up, is there anything that you would tell somebody start here, or this is where I would recommend starting? Like, I know we just said, we're not trying to give too much advice, <laughs> but, um, I'm going to make you do it. But the, um, but yeah, is there anything, where would you start with that sort of idea? Like, yeah, I can, I can really only speak from my experience and, and, what I valued in that and something if someone were to ask me that directly like what should I do if I want to go from homestead to farm is um, I got so much value and benefit I can't even really quantify it from my experience managing a commercial operation first and you know I think you can get part of the way there working on farms as a crew, but the level of responsibility I had in the management role and the level of i guess intel I had to the finances and operations and decision making that went into it uh, it kind of calibrated me to commercial scale as opposed to home scale and understanding what it takes and what infrastructure and tools and equipment are appropriate at a commercial scale that aren't inappropriate or that aren't appropriate at a, a homestead scale and so yeah my years managing that farm just it really shifted my ability to a, a level that if i had gone straight to homesteading from farming at least me personally without that experience the learning curve would have been really really steep and it would have really I think negatively impacted the business in a lot of ways that that time that I spent doing that, even though the production methods weren't similar, just being at that scale and understanding what it takes uh, is part of why Wild East has been able to uh, be relatively successful in the first year. Aaron, do you want to take that? And then I can get back to the Eric as well. Um, uh, things you would say to somebody that's getting contemplating this or wanting to 
you know, go from their homestead and scale up. Yeah. I mean, speaking from my side of the experience, which was coming to, I mean, in in my mid thirties, I have four kids. The, um, the conversation, like everyone, the best advice I got from everybody is work at another farm first, if you can. And I, that I would be my first advice, but that was not an option for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I did visit and would spend like a day at a farm doing various things as I could, but I would say, speaking to it from if this, if those things aren't available to you, that's not an option. At the end of the day, you have to decide if I am making the transition from a homestead to farming for production, if this is a business, then there is a level of emotion and hobbyism that you have to abandon for the sake of making an economically viable thing, because you're always going to be values driven that I could spend every waking moment with my hands in the dirt and that seems really precious and valuable and it drives you so far and then you achieve burnout and and you would give your whole life to it you know what i mean and maybe never actually become profitable if you're only viewing it as this hobby that got big so there are efficiencies you've got to learn there are investments you do have to make in order for the scale to work even if your scale is small and so um yeah, I would say figure out what those kind of handicaps are as far as what's making me stay out here, what's spending, what's eating up my time in a way that I didn't mind giving when it was for funsies. Um, but, you know, at some point I need to go inside and make a meal for my family, um, kind of setting up that think it has to be a business, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And also just audience, if you have any questions, I'm going to take a few minutes to have questions here in a minute. So just have that in your mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, I can't stand running a business and I run two of them. It's like my least, like, but here's the thing. I didn't realize I was starting one, right? Because kind of what Aaron was saying, like I wanted to farm. My wife and I wanted to farm. We loved farm. We loved being in the dirt. We loved working outside, like love good food, uh, all of those things. But like, it's not a business, right? Like, <laughs> But it is, and that's the reality is like, it took us way too long to be like, okay, well, we have to care about numbers and stuff. And, and that in some ways was really hard. So like for us, that's just not our personality. And there are times when I'm like, I kind of just wish I could go back to being a W2 employee and like, you know, somebody else does the taxes. Um, but like that, you know, the reality is once you get to that if you're going through that, you will be starting a business if you're going to be scaling up. Like all the numbers, all of those things absolutely matter. But the beauty in the numbers is that they're very freeing. Mm -hmm. They, and if once you lock them down and you start looking at like where your product, where your production is getting wasted, where your time is getting wasted, you can get that time back. You can recapture that. It's a, it's something that you can give to your children for, for, uh, which is important to us or whatever. Um, whatever you want to do, your hobbies, you know, whatever's important to you. Uh, so there is a beauty in starting a business, but you do have to be willing to acknowledge from the start that it is a business. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, is there anything else you want to add to that? I would just expound because I really highly with everything that was said, uh, with the exception that I am naturally predisposition to really enjoy spreadsheets and all the record keeping aspects, um, so I actually find a lot of joy in that part of the process. Like I really like doing my taxes. It was it was actually kind of fun. I put up a fuss about it, and then once that I was doing it, I was like, this is awesome because it's empowering to know your business and to know where you are. And the way that I've framed that whole back end aspect of what we're doing, the spreadsheets, the emails, all the record keeping, all of it is a tool and a currency to make you a better land steward um, and to help you grow as a person. So I just try to allow those things to be received as valuable and empowering. You said joy, there's joy in it, there's beauty in it. Um, and really it just, it makes you able to farm better, which I think is all of our goals all the time. So um, yeah, that's all I'll add. Yeah. Yeah. I found it very, I mean, I enjoy spreadsheets now, which is why if I told myself 15 years ago, <laughs> you're going to say that sentence, you'd be like, I'm done. We're leaving. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's very liberating. Mm-hmm. Um, and no, is there anything there that you feel like you could add? I think, add? I think they covered it pretty nicely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Um, so if, does anybody have any questions? We can take a few questions. Uh, yeah, good. Go ahead. Sure. My question is about um, homesteading and saving money. Was that helpful for you when you're getting this nest egg going with like growing your own food? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. The question, just so, so the question was, did homesteading enable us to save money because we were growing our own food? Yes, uh, for sure. Yeah, our cost of living at Shoke Creek was extremely low because we were growing so much of our own food. And um, I worked like partially from home. So like gas costs were lower and I was able to orient. The reason I oriented myself to that was because I love being on the land. So the homestead enabled that. Um, yeah we were eating 100% of our vegetables, meats, eggs, um, to a, a lower degree, but still very significant, and foraging in the forest, all those things. I would say the homestead. Additionally, the homestead was um, quite old and somewhat decaying, and so in What's our... The house, the house, um, the actual home. Um, but in living there for six years and improving the land so dramatically in our time there... Um, the landowner increasingly reduced our rent while we were there. Um, and so our cost of rent went down as we were improving the land because the trust was built through that process. So certainly our time there, very low cost of living, enabled us to save a lot. And in addition to just the grocery bill, I think our entertainment needs being cheap and free and what we're doing already where we didn't we didn't go, go out to, we didn't go out to <laughs> like we were spending money traveling and, and concerts and like that's all great awesome fun stuff but with the goal of aggressive savings just like we can just hang out here and do this fun stuff and derive that same satisfaction uh that that you can get in other ways in a way that is just immediately accessible and doesn't have a high price tag mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I, I wish I'd known you all back then when we were doing this because I didn't have that idea at all. I was like, let's do, let's not make money and go out a lot. <laughs> so I, now I see my, where I screwed up. But, uh, other questions? Yep. We just finished our first year of farming and now we're sort of struggling with, like, okay, we have all of these areas where we need to get better where we focus our time and money and especially like buying things that would make our lives easier versus just trying to keep doing workarounds or like putting more time into them. I'm just curious how you all have approached that how you scaled up. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take that? Can yeah, you I can speak to that a little bit. The question was, um, they just finished their first year of farming and realized these areas of growth um, and kind of trying to decide where do you make the investment on improving the areas that were struggling. Um, I have an example of this, which is that my first year, because we were putting in major infrastructure projects, my tools budget was extremely low. And I thought, you know, like, I'm going to get by with a stirrup hoe and I don't need a cedar. I'm going to, I have hands. I can, I can put every seed in the ground and I would spend two hours per bed hand sowing carrots at a, you know, a one inch spacing, um, so that I wouldn't have to go back and thin it. And then this past year I invested in a Jang and I literally cried after I sowed the first time in seven minutes <laughs> thinking about the hours and hours that I had wasted the year before to save me what, like $400. Um, so I, I would probably, if you have, you probably have some intuitive knowing about what things were taking the most time. Personally, that's where I would invest in first is what are going to be the time saving either tools or new systems we need to develop. Are there SOPs that we can like tighten up to, um, yeah, make ourselves more efficient. And then the other element for me is in harvest and post-harvest handling, wash pack. Um, yeah, same thing I did. I had a five gallon hand crank salad spinner the first year and then um, was gifted by some wonderful farmers near me, at, you know, the washing machine setup. And it, again, life-changing. And so it saved a ton of time, but also it was making improvements in the quality of my product. And if you're improving the quality of your product, you can charge more for it. So like, 
Yeah, I mean, there are there are things like that. You can do the math. I mean, you can guess at the math, but you think about should we invest in a high tunnel? That's a lot of money, but okay, look at how much better my tomatoes are and how much I'm not wasting because they're not splitting and they're not getting disease. And so I yeah, I would maybe do a little bit of reflecting on your biggest time sinks and then the places where you're maybe losing product because you don't have a good efficient system in place. And that's where I would invest first. Mm -hmm. So, that was just agreeing. That was a okay. great answer. <laughs> great. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm completely there with you. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. You guys are thinking more about leasing. I think about it right now, kind of like, I think of it now, I like, kind of as a foster parent, where even though you might love something, you have to give it back. It's still a valuable experience no matter what. So mm. I picked that up for you guys. It was interesting. If, if someone's interested in pursuing leasing, I mean, how do you get the word out in an area? How, how do you, how might you go about you know, trying to fight? I mean, I know there's a lot of aging farmers and you know, people that have too much land that they can't manage. How would you go about kind of fighting it? Yeah, uh, I can speak to that. And so the question was, if you're looking to lease land as, as your way to access a farm, uh, what's the best way to find the opportunities that are available out there? And it depends in, in my understanding of it somewhat on your location. Uh, so we're fortunate in North Carolina and there's other states uh, nearby that, that have a similar program called FarmLink. And there's, there's a website run through the state extension here called North Carolina Farm Link. And it's essentially an interactive map tool where landowners can post their lease opportunities or like sale opportunities. Um, and land seekers can create profiles and get in contact with those landowners and vice versa. So that's how we found Wild East was on Farm Link after spending four years clicking through and visiting places and meeting people uh but it's a pretty robust uh system and i know just offhand i could think of four or five different farmers in western north carolina i know who found their farm on farm link uh so that's that's a good one in north carolina i know virginia tennessee and south carolina i know for sure i'll have them but they're around the country um it's probably the most streamlined way but if you're in a rural community you've been in for a while, it's never it never hurts to talk to neighbors and just be putting out feelers all the time uh, and just be saying it over and over again. And, and, you know, I think that way it can come back to you as well. <laughs> yep. Uh, this question is for Erin. Um, I'm also a mom and I, I'm starting the farm, but I'm going to be the only person working this far. So what is, how much land is realistic to be able to cultivate? <laughs> the question is how much land is, uh, able, is realistic for cultivating as a, an individual and especially as a mother. And, and still profitable. Yeah. Transition out of like a nine to five. Yeah. I'm well, I think there's going to be so many factors at play. Even what you choose to grow, you could probably cultivate a really small piece of your property with a high value crop and you know maybe it's not a traditional farmer's market model but i'm gonna sell this one particular really fancy something or other to restaurants in my area like there are i think there are ways to structure the vision for the business that can be more profitable in small space um, whether you have children or whatever i would say consider your body um, when i opened up that quarter acre for me my i really thought like what can my body handle i don't have a bcs if i did i couldn't push it um and so yeah, thinking about the level of physical exertion you feel like you can handle and then the margin to walk away. My kids are in public school, so that's a big difference for me. I don't have them at home for six hours a day. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a lot. There's a, an element of sacrifice that, you know, we wanted to see this dream come to life. And I work really hard and a lot of crazy hours and I have a really supportive partner who through the summer when my kids are home from school he's primary parent and you know I have that support in that way so um a quarter a quarter acre worked for me but then I also my dream changed because I thought I wanted to do it myself and then I was doing it and I was seeing the potential and I thought gosh if I had help this land could do more and I could make more money because you know two people working together sometimes is even the sum is 
greater than yeah the you know what I'm saying? The what's the <laughs> phrase? Yeah. The post lunch slump. Um, so yeah, but now I have a part time employee, and I didn't think that I would want that, and but it enables me to do more and or to have better balance. So sorry, I didn't exactly answer your question, but those are factors I would consider. Yeah, and and my wife is now now that our kids are a little bit more independent and able to kind of do their own thing. They're mm -hmm. nine and six. That has changed our her relationship to what she can do as well because she's you know i try and help as much as i can but my i'm i have to be out there cultivating most of the time but now that they're a little bit more independent she's been able to do more so there is also yeah that like she was saying her kids are in public school as they get older depending on what the situation is that may free you up or yeah may make it more more possible mm -hmm. um other questions yep can you give some advice on how to take a uh Hobby property that consumes everything over time into being profitable. Like, what are the best steps on looking back? Like, for you guys, how did you go from homestead to for a profitable farm here? Aaron, from this is my garden that I love, I put all my time into to now it's making me money. I can start. I think there was that. a repeat it. Oh, the question was, how did you transition from? this beautiful magical i put all my love into this garden into the business like running a business is that the question yeah, like that's... kind of I to go from like a hobby i'm actually going to like order for those who suffer from like analysis paralysis mm -hmm. i need to just actually get right um i think there was a really easy distinction for us because we moved properties right so we did not transition the homestead into a business which uh, is different than Aaron's situation which to me has it sounds like it has its own challenges because then you're in the same place that you've had this other relationship with for us having that change of place distinction was very clear it's like okay we are moving to this place to start a business there was no question um, so it, it made that transition fairly easy for us because it had been pre-planned. We knew we needed to move. We found the place. We did the move. And so we were really just following the path that we had envisioned happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe. I think some really practical things it was even just uh, standardizing, like my bed length and width mm -hmm. and just so these basic efficiencies for you can still find a lot of joy and maybe dabble with the fun varieties, but, but build your garden layout in a productive, I can run down every aisle with the same hoe type thing um, helped a lot, even just from switching my mindset to being more productive for the sake of profitability. Yeah. Yeah, maybe also just recognizing where the time is being wasted. Like mm -hmm. you, you'd mentioned, like it was like an unprofitable thing to maybe want, or not an unproductive thing you wanted to turn into a profitable thing. Uh, yeah, maybe just recognizing where the time is being wasted, where the money is going, and and figuring out how to either make that more productive or get rid of it mm -hmm. for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I, can I have one? I have one more thought on that. Yeah. Uh, when I was gardening for my family, I planted things that we liked to eat. And then whenever they were ready, we would eat them or deal with them. And I think that there's a lot to be said about choosing what you're going to grow with the end sales result in mind. Um, so that you're not, you know, I think one funny anecdote for a lot of home gardeners is they'll plant lettuce one time in the spring, a whole bed of it. And then it all is ready at the same time. And they're I have maybe two weeks at best for this to last in my refrigerator. Okay, family, we're only eating salad for the next 15 days. But then they don't have a lettuce for the rest of the summer because they, that, you know, the garden mindset is we just plant it and then we get what we get from it. And so I would also think too, like maybe dabble in some succession planting, learn, you know, like what, what can we work through? What can I sell in a week? And then, you know, with those sales goals in mind, work your way backwards to deciding what you're even going to put in the ground. And I have one more, I have yeah. something to add as well. Um, something I see a lot <clears throat> in the transition for, for early farms is, uh, particularly if folks have a homestead background, is an attachment to some of the ideal, idealistic parts that are possible on a homestead. So, for example, like heirloom varieties or, or heritage breeds of animals that I certainly value, you know, but when you run the numbers, you can't always make that work on a farm scale. And like, as much as 
it would be great to only raise like heritage, dual purpose, 100% organic fed chickens across all pastured chicken farms in the country. Those chickens would cost like $40 a pound. Um, and like, that's how you have to make the numbers work to do that. And if the market can't bear that, you have to make certain sacrifices in that realm that fit the business context. And, um, yeah, I think it can be hard to let go of some of that idealism, but looking at the goals that are in mind regarding improving the soil and building a business that can sustain and, and living the day-to-day -day quality of life and having a customer base that is able to buy the products that you sell. Uh, is all worth it to make those sacrifices and adjustments. Can I add one quick yeah. thing? Um, I feel like we haven't talked about the customer aspect very much. You mentioned your CSA, um, but I think that's maybe an element that gets forgotten in the homestead transition as well, because it's like you're growing all this food for yourself and your friends and everybody loves it. And of course, everyone would want to buy it, but where <laughs> are you actually going to sell it? Um, so I run one of the farmer's markets in Asheville and if you apply to sell vegetables at markets in Asheville, like you're not going to get in. Um, so doing some market research and some assessment of where you can actually sell your food. If you want to do wholesale, if you want to do markets, CSA, there's lots of options. You can sell the food. We could, everyone, the proportion of local food that people are eating is so small relative to the population and how much food people are still buying at grocery stores. I'm a firm believer that we need more small farms and we can move the needle on that all day long, but you might have to get creative and you might have to have a plan before you have 200 heads of lettuce and nobody wants it um, mm -hmm. to reduce waste, uh, food waste, economic waste um, on your farm. So be thinking about the sales part as you're planning what you're going to grow to ensure that you can actually sell it. Uh, that's great. I wanted to just say thank you. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, I wanted to say thank you for everyone who's come. Uh, thank you to Lyric, to Noah, to Aaron for your contributions, and we really appreciate it, and thank you to the OGS for hosting us. All right, how awesome are those folks, right? Uh, truly some of my favorite people there. We will make sure to put some links in the show notes for how to follow both Cedar Chest Farm and Wild East Farm. You can also check out the video tour we did with Wild East recently over at our video channel. Huge shout out to Jackson Roulette for all his help with these videos and to our editor, Michael Sellis, for cleaning up the audio always. If you like these podcast videos or any of the videos we do, consider picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook, for instance, at notillgrowers.com or a hat or other merch. Also consider joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash notillgrowers. There's a post over there asking those members what they'd like to see more of from our farm and our work on this channel. Being a Patreon member enables you to help make those decisions. Also, there are some new discount codes over there, which is also rad. And at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. I'm gonna blow away. So big shout outs this week to Chris Yates, Doug Wilkes, Sean at All About the Garden, Stephen Smith and Cameron Prybull. So super thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for your support. We'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>